Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Shannon. I'd like to welcome you to this day-long program on borderline personality disorder, effective therapeutic interventions with the impossible patient. Um, and of course, the term impossible there, I'm using that term uh, in, in a way kind of sarcastically because the theme of today's program is that they are not impossible patients to treat if you know what you're doing. Um, I'm delighted to be with you. Uh, I come to you from Columbus. I'm based here in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I'm a licensed psychologist. I've been in uh, private practice now for 31 years. Uh, I'm on staff at a number of hospitals here in Columbus. Um, the closest one would be Riverside Methodist Hospital where I've been on staff there for 25 years. Now let's talk about the program. And this information, of course, is going to apply to you folks out um, uh, uh, attending this via a webinar setup or uh, doing this in the privacy of your home. Uh, the course booklet that I'm going to be going over with now with my group here in, in Columbus is identical to the course book that you have there in front of you, the course booklet. So I'm going to go over this booklet with all of you folks. This is going to make the day very user-friendly for you. Now I know some of you are going to be terribly disappointed, but I am not going to do a six-hour mind-numbing PowerPoint presentation with you in a darkened room with you madly taking notes from PowerPoint slides as I read them to you in a schizoid, disinterested voice. I know that that has become the standard of excellence for these programs, but I think it's a horrible way to teach adult learners. I refer to that as death by PowerPoint. So I'm not going to put you through that today. All of the notes that you need for today's program are typed and in your packet. So you can just sit back, relax, take in the information. You're not going to have to do much in the way of note taking today. Now, I was asked to put this uh, program together back in February of this year, even though we knew that we would be taping uh, now. The good news is, is that I, th I think it's a really pretty good program, but you'll be the judge of that. Here's the not so good news. In May of this year, uh, the DSM-5 was published the new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. Oh joy, oh rapture. And um, there are terminology changes um, in the DSM-5 uh, compared to the previous DSM, the DSM-4 text revision. 99.9% .9 of your notes are consistent with the DSM-5. In fact, um, in the DSM-5, we still have borderline personality disorder. It's defined in exactly the same way, the same diagnostic criteria. So that's nothing of, of, of that nature has been changed. The biggest change in the DSM-5 in terms of how it pertains to today's topic of borderline personality disorder is this. We no longer diagnose using a multi-axial system. So axis 1, axis 2, axis 3, 4, and 5, that's all now history. We no longer do that. As of the DSM-5 goes into effect January of next year, January of 2014. So um, it used to be that we referred to personality disorders, borderline being one of them, we referred to personality disorders as axis two disorders. So that's no longer the case. Now we just call them personality disorders. And what used to be called axis one disorders, the term that's being used in the DSM-5 is clinical syndromes, clinical syndromes. So I think once or twice in your notes, I use the term axis one or axis two. Just cross out axis one and put clinical syndrome. Cross out axis two and put personality disorders and you'll be good to go. But apart from that, your notes are hip, hop, and happening, I promise you, okay? So let's take a look at the front page, the cover page of your uh, little notebook there. I put this together for you for two reasons. One, this is the information that your board would want to see in the event that you're ever audited by your board. Around the country, boards are now auditing their members. I was just audited last year by the um, State Board of Psychology. If you're ever audited by your board, here's what you need to know. They operate exactly like the IRS. They expect you to keep seven years of meticulous records on every course that you take organized by year. So you should already have started your 2013 folder. Minimally, they want to see two pieces of information on every course that you take. They want to see an abstract page, which is what you've got here, and I'll go over that with you in just a minute, and they also want to see a hard copy 
of your certificate of completion that verifies you intended uh, you attended the entire program. So if you keep this along with your certificate that you'll get later on file, you'll pass the audit for this course. Let's take a look at what's on this cover page. You have the entire title of the program, Treating Borderline Personality Disorders, Understanding Intense, Impulsive, and Volatile Relationships. You have the name and credentials of your instructor. For you medical people, we've included a disclaimer statement. All of the various medical boards require that. What that means is, is that if I mention a specific medical product to you today, like the drug Prozac, you can rest assured that I don't hold shares in the pharmaceutical company that produces Prozac. So there's no conflict of interest. That's required by all of the medical boards. Then you have the name of the organization sponsoring today's event, which is the Institute for Brain Potential. They used to be called Cortex Seminars. Uh, we're based in Los Angeles, California. I work out of that office. The Institute um, is a nonprofit, and that's why we were able to bring today's program to you uh, for less than half the cost of what these day-long programs typically go for. And then if you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see a rectangle. And in that rectangle, you'll see the three primary learning objectives for today's course which summarize course content. Your board would want to see that uh, in the event that you're ever audited by your board. So everything you need for your board is on one page there. So that's why I wanted you to have that. Secondarily, this afternoon, when you're completing your evaluation forms, you're going to be asked to evaluate me and this course based largely on the extent to which I've covered those th uh, three objectives with you. So you can refer back to those this afternoon when you're completing your evaluation form. You've got everything there that you need. Turn to the back side of your front cover, because we're using two-sided copies today. Back side. That page is entitled Policies and Procedures. That is nothing more than a summary of the morning announcements. So if you miss those announcements, if you came in late or didn't hear them for some reason, they're all summarized there for you. You can review that information later at your leisure. Go to the next page. That is a much more detailed description of course content, um, and I'll go over that with you now because it'll give you a nice idea of the flow of topics for today. My first objective is to spend just a little bit of time with you talking about what it means to have a personality disorder. So I'll very briefly define what personality is, what a personality disorder is, because that's going to obviously be some, uh, important and helpful groundwork when talking about uh, borderline personality disorder. I will also talk about uh, common characteristics that we see with all personality disorders, not just with a borderline personality disorder. Here's the bigger picture, folks. Borderline personality disorder is one of 10 delicious flavors of personality disorder. And all of these are listed and described in nauseating detail in the new Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM-5. We used to have 12 flavors. With the publication of the DSM-5, we now have 10 flavors. Those 10 flavors are grouped into three happy clusters based on common or shared characteristics. The clusters are, are you ready for this, A, B, and C. Isn't that innovative? Cluster A is called the odd or the eccentric cluster, and there are three flavors in that cluster, the paranoid, the schizoid, and the schizotypal. They're the odd or the eccentric, and what they have in common is all three of them are weird as hell. You only have to interact with these people for about two minutes to realize that there are a few fries short of a happy meal. Um, there's nothing subtle about their pathology. It just hits you in the face from the moment that you meet them. Then we have cluster B as in Bravo. Cluster B is called the dramatic or emotional cluster. And it's called this cluster for two reasons. One, all cluster B personalities have profound problems with affect regulation, most especially in controlling their anger. And two, all cluster B personalities have extreme difficulty with impulse control 
and judgment. They exercise poor judgment. They're highly impulsive. There are four flavors in this cluster. The antisocial personality, sometimes referred to as the sociopathic personality, the borderline personality, which is the focus of today's program, the histrionic personality, and last but never least, they would never want to be thought of as last or least, the narcissistic personality. So those four are cluster B. Today's topic of borderline personality is obviously one of the four flavors that you see with cluster B. Cluster C is called the anxious or fearful cluster. And uh, there are three flavors here, the avoidant, the dependent, and the compulsive, sometimes referred to as the perfectionistic personality. And what all three of those have in common is they all have an inordinate amount of anxiety and fear, typically beginning in childhood, that they manage in a way that's ultimately self-defeating by the time that they're adults. That's what they have in common. So we're talking today about one of those 10 delicious flavors, and that's the borderline personality. And the borderline personality is arguably the most famous of all personality disorders because it's been depicted more than any other personality disorder in major motion pictures. And later today, I'm going to give you a partial list of major motion pictures that feature prominently borderline characters. The borderline triad, triad meaning three. The three components again are any type of limit setting is perceived as abandonment. That's the first piece of the triad. That leads to emotional distress, typically rage. That's the second part of the triad. And the emotional distress leads to psychological defense either acting out or acting in. That's the borderline triad. So Otto Kernberg was the very first to articulate that. And for those of you who have worked with patients with borderline disorder, you'll know that the borderline triad uh, is a process that occurs in all of their relationships, including their relationship with you, the caregiver, the borderline triad. So that's essentially how the disorder was, de was defined way back in 1960. The person straddles the border between neurosis and psychosis. Um, their psychotic thinking and behavior is triggered by real or perceived abandonment. And that real or perceived abandonment um, sets the stage for psychotic rage that's either acted out aggressively towards the other person or that's directed on the individual. Kernberg also pointed out, just in case you're interested, that the disorder could occur in both men and women. You know, historically, this was seen as a, a woman's disorder, women's disorder. Kernberg said it could occur in men. And he said that it played out differently in men and women. He said women were much more likely to act in when they were triggered, to do something self-destructive. Men were much more likely to act out in an aggressive way because of socialization differences between men and women. So Kernberg was really a visionary. I mean, he was really, Kernberg was a genius, okay? So that's how it was defined way back in 1960. Now, I thought that you would get a kick out of hearing how a mystery writer describes borderline personality disorder. Are you ready for this? But this isn't just any mystery writer. This is the great Jonathan Kellerman. How many of you know who Jonathan Kellerman is? Jonathan Kellerman is a PhD clinical child psychologist based in Los Angeles. And he is a very well respected uh, both clinician and researcher in the area of child psychopathology. But what he's best known for is writing a series of murder mysteries dating back to the mid 1980s. And his murder mysteries feature an unlikely duo of sleuths one is a forensic psychologist by the name of Alex Delaware, and his longtime friend and buddy is Milo Sturgis, who works for the LAPD as a homicide detective. And the two of them solve grisly murder cases in LA. They've, uh, Kellerman's written a series of books featuring Alex Delaware and his sidekick Milo, 
and they've all been international bestsellers. Back in 1990, he wrote what was to become one of his all-time bestsellers, and the title of the book was Silent Partner. It's still in print. You can get it. Um, and one of the prime suspects in a murder investigation in the book Silent Partner is, has borderline personality disorder, and her name is Sharon. This is how a psychologist back in 1990 describes borderline personality disorder. I love this. Borderline personality disorder. If Sharon had deserved that diagnosis, it flirted with disaster. The borderline patient is a therapist's nightmare. During my training years, before I decided to specialize in working with children, I treated more than my fair share of borderlines and learned that the hard way. Or rather, I tried to treat my borderline patients because borderlines never really get better. The best you can do is help them coast without getting sucked into their pathology. At first glance, they look normal, sometimes even super normal, holding down high pressure jobs and excelling. But they walk a constant tightrope between madness and sanity, unable to form relationships, incapable of achieving insight, never free from a deep, corroding sense of worthlessness and rage that spills over inevitably into self-destruction. And here's my favorite piece. They're the chronically depressed, the determinedly addictive, the compulsively divorced, living from one emotional disaster to the next. Bed hoppers, stomach pumpers, freeway jumpers, and sad-eyed bench sitters with arms stitched up like footballs and psychic wounds that can never be sutured. Their egos are as fragile as spun sugar. Their psyches irretrievably fragmented like a jigsaw puzzle with crucial pieces missing. They play roles with alacrity. They excel at being anyone but themselves. They crave intimacy, but ultimately repel it when they find it. Some of them gravitate towards stage or screen. Others do their acting in more subtle ways. No one knows how or why a borderline becomes a borderline. The Freudians claim it's due to emotional deprivation during the first two years of life. The biochemical engineers blame faulty wiring. Neither school claims to be able to help these people very much. Borderlines go from therapist to therapist, hoping to find a magic bullet for the crushing feelings of emptiness. They turn to chemical bullets, gobble tranquilizers and antidepressants, alcohol and cocaine. They embrace gurus and heaven hucksters, any charismatic creep promising a quick fix for their pain. And they end up taking temporary vacations in psychiatric wards and in prison cells. They oftentimes emerge looking good, raising everyone's hopes until the next letdown, real or imagined, the next excursion into self-damage. What they don't do is change.